Hello again, and yes, it is a very misty morning this morning. When I opened up the door to my room at 4.30 this morning, you couldn't even see into the courtyard where we stay. Have a look at this. This is very typical of a, of a, uh, of a season change day. In other words, we are moving from our winter time, well actually we're moving from spring really, into our summer time. And what happens is as these weather systems, at, on a macro scale, as these weather systems start to change, a low pressure system starts to approach the Mozambique coastline and we eventually end up over hovering over the, the South Africa's uh, eastern side uh, and the Indian Ocean depending on the conditions of the year and that brings a lot of moist air into what is still quite chilly evenings for the low felt or this particular area of the world and what happens is you get dew point temperature being reached low down to the ground which creates condensation and that is what we're seeing right now so we're standing in a cloud mist is basically a cloud that is formed on the ground now as the sun rises which should be in the next couple of minutes, I'm hoping we'll see it as a brilliant orange or yellow ball. And as the sun radiates out, it's a shortwave radiation, which we don't really feel. The ground absorbs that shortwave radiation and it reflects it again, or let's say, not reflects it, but it changes it to long wave heat felt radiation and that starts to lift the cloud up. And so this will burn off by the time the safari is finished today. No doubt, but now from now it's going to be a beautifully clear very calm very cloudless day here in the herald of things to come now don't forget that you can use twitter and youtube to ask me questions during the safari myself and my colleagues hopefully in the mara will come online in a little bit for now you've just got myself and vm on camera today <coughs> excuse me vm i didn't introduce you and uh, we are on quarantine clearings. Now, with the mist being so thick, we didn't want to leave these cleared areas uh, too early this morning because you can't see where you're going. And of course, we don't want to do that. Now, right now, I feel like waiting for the sun from here because it's going to be spectacular. The visibility is at about 100 yards or so, <clears throat> which is more than enough to keep us safe on these open areas. And the sun will be up in a little bit. I'm sure, why don't we walk down the road a little bit and we can wait for the sun to come up. The plan today is to go into a portion of the reserve that I've missed dearly since I've uh, been in Kenya, which is the entire uh, eastern side of the Mulwati. So, this particular area where we're in right now is split by what we call a drainage line or a creek bed. Um, and... <clears throat> The, the botany on the eastern side is, uh, is far more diverse than it is on the western side. For some reason, and I don't really know what it is, and it's probably geology related. In other words, the underlying rock structure uh, which determines the, 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 the soil profile on top of it um, is probably a bit deeper or a bit richer on that side uh, than it is on this side. And it gives for a more diverse for a more, more diverse. Uh, um, plant communities, if I can call it you that way, with the most diverse being in the southeastern corner. I haven't seen, in the Sabi Sands, I haven't seen such a diverse plant community in any other place in all of this 65,000 hectares wilderness that we have to walk around in. Now, for those of you who are just joining the show, <coughs> you'll notice that I keep on talking about different things. The Kruger National Park, South Africa, Sabi Sands, Juma. To put it into a bit of perspective, let me draw you a map. <coughs> Excuse me, I've developed a cold over the evening and I'm uh, developing vast quantities of substances that are foreign. Alright, so South Africa comes down to Cape Town. And then it basically angles up. Now, this is the Atlantic Ocean. This is the Indian Ocean. This is Cape Town. Right there. This is Johannesburg. We've got some lions roaring. Done. There. There. So it'll be very difficult for you to hear these lions. We're going to try and put up. Oh, we won't be able to. We don't have an ambient microphone. 
but they where Herbie is now he's walking in that direction um, <clears throat> those lines are probably about with this mist those lines are probably about two miles from here and that is going to change uh, our plans for the morning because I do think that they inside or on the boundary Bivol's hook boundary so after I finish this we'll go and we'll walk out there all right so this is Johannesburg the Kruger National Park lies right up again Mozambique lies here the Kruger National Park basically lies like this up against Mozambique basically Johannesburg is a little bit higher Johannesburg the Sabi Sands is <coughs> this little portion of land right here and we are right there and that's basically not to scale of obviously but basically if I were to stand in South Africa <coughs> this is the Limpopo River and our border with Zimbabwe and, and Botswana this is all South Africa Johannesburg up here west of Johannesburg a massive area it's 400 miles from top to bottom is the Kruger National Park one of the largest wilderness areas left in the world attached to the Kruger National Park is a privately owned game reserve called the Sabi Sands inside this this conglomerate of private reserves is a little reserve called Juma private game reserve and we are in it no fences there's no fences internally there's no fences inside the park animals have got almost 10 million acres of bush to walk around in <coughs> and live in uh, completely undisturbed with the exception of people like us and a variety of other field guides who uh, who then can access these animals and show them to you over the course of a year all right let's go look for these lion Let's first go and see why there's a bunch of bird droppings. Mka, you wanted to know about the birds that are calling? Basically, it's just been those ones that VM were just showing you there now, which are a bunch of crowned lapwings. Um, there's also a turtleneck dove calling here. So that loud shouting, that's that uh, crowned lapwing. That trilling noise is a dove I'm trying to hear any oh and we've got a hoopoe that hoop, hoop, hoop. that's an African hoopoe calling now I want to see why there's so much bird droppings on top of this termite mound <coughs> usually it's because termites have been active but in this particular case I think birds are using a particular bird because the droppings are all the same size and consistency I think what's happening is a bird a showy bird is using this as a perch to uh, to show himself off so I would imagine that it's probably a starling or a Franklin of some sort that's sitting up here either during the day or at a change of days and is uh, and is using this as a stage basically to show everyone how pretty he is but there's no sun today he isn't in attendance don't fall there Viam. <coughs> I'll try my best and look for some bush remedies to give my my cold um, <coughs> or oh, the flu that I'm developing a bit of a helping hand today elephant dung works to open up sinuses a fever tea is brilliant you can take dry fever tea and you can smoke it either in a bowl on a fire or you can put it into a, a pipe of some sort depending on where your your flu is you can take fresh fever tea and you can sniff it like a menthol or I suppose eucalyptus and then you can lay it onto a fire or in a humidifier and you can steam out upper respiratory tract uh, infections and loosen up mucus there that's what I feel like I have right now uh, or you can smoke it and and draw the, 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 the fumes down into your lungs and what that does is that loosens up phlegm and mucus deep down in your lungs and enables you to cough it out so fever tea is probably the best remedy for colds and flu that we have out here with uh, with uh, thanks everybody He's saying I hope I feel better I don't actually feel too bad um, <clears throat> with the exception of just probably I don't know 
being like a bull elephant in maths only without the results in testosterone increase. Um, <clears throat> and the second one is the fruit of the marula. Now, <clears throat> in profile, you can see that this, this marula here has got this lovely fringe of new growth on the top and that is just testimony to spring being here these trees will will, will really fill out with a big leaf they've got a compound leaf which not a lot of people know because a compound leaf is like a fern basically it's one big leaf blade that's broken down into lots of different leaflets so a a marula's leaf is probably about a foot big by a foot wide, but broken down into about eight or twelve different leaflets, and each leaflet is about this big, as big as a big coin. And <clears throat> so it makes you think it looks like just one leaf, but in actual fact, the marula tree has got really large leaves broken down into smaller ones, and that makes it very effective at uh, at blocking out the sun basically catching all the sun the tree that's super effective at catching the most sun obviously does the best and as you can see a marula tree one of the big boys out here the heavyweights so to say ah, this is a brilliant road for tracking <coughs> Jared's buddy, you'd like to know, is going on bushwalk while it's misty more risky? Um, let me just think about that. No, I don't think so. I think up to a point, to be honest with you. I think that, that you are given uh, a certain amount of reaction time to see stuff. Now, obviously, if you see an elephant down there because you've gotten a glimpse of it, it's... It, it is, it's not as safe as a clear day. But because this terrain is so undulating, I mean, have a look. Here we're on top of a crest and the bush dips down. Our visibility here is not even 20 or 30 yards. In summer, it won't even be five yards here. Um, and so whether it's mist or whether it's thick bush or whether it's wind, I feel that here we've got a realistic safety zone around us of about 20 yards and that is where your danger zone is and in a, on a misty morning like today our visibility extends just beyond 20 yards and for that reason I think it's no more do, no more dangerous than it would be in midsummer or when it's very windy or you know um, or when it's misty like it is now so not not really now there was a chin spot battus that came in here, but I started off by saying that this road is one of those roads that uh, is very good for tracking. The Sabi Sands is substrate. This granitic soil that we're seeing over here holds detail of tracks incredibly well. It's one of the best substrates to do track and sign evaluations on. And I have so many fond memories of my own track and sign or tracking qualifications as I was gaining qualifications in my youth, I want to say, but earlier on in my career. Um, <clears throat> and some roads are just better than others. They're just better placed for traffic of different animals. Usually the roads that head down, down slope, uh, bisecting the slope are the best ones. And this particular road has a lot of different tracks on it. Right now we've got the tracks of a hyena, a spotted hyena. This is the tracks right here. The much larger front foot sitting in front of this much smaller back foot. I know it's a hyena because of the presence of a claw indent, that half moon outer toe, the slanted back pad to the direction of movement, and the two lobes and the size. That tells me that it's a spotted hyena. Could it be a brown hyena? Yes, but not in this area. Um, it's more than likely just the wanderings of a spotted hyena. Further, we have a genet which has been walking here and I want to see if I can get you a nice track of this genet because otherwise it's just going to look like a dent in the sand yes here we go VM finding it so there we have the genet here it is over here and I know it's a genet track from that back pad that you can see there so here is the indent of its wrist pad also, the slightly off, if it was a mongoose that have oval toes, the presence of slight claws, as, as they've pushed on the pad, they've got sort of semi-retractable claws that sometimes come out. And then that three equal shaped lobes, and then the side, it's my thumb size. So Janet has a, has a paw the size of my thumb when spread out in thick sand. So we've got the Janet there. 
Let's see what else I can show you. Termite activity. A dove. So we've got a dove. Probably a turtle neck dove. And I know that it's a dove. Here we go. One, two, three forward facing toes. One backward facing toe. One, two, three forward facing toes. And a backward facing toe there. And that curved middle toe tells me it's a dove. They've got a gait that if you draw a line back toe to front toe, it makes a sinuous line. And it's because they've got short fat squat bodies with short legs, which makes them waddle. And it makes for this sinewy line when you draw a line through their toes. So that's a turtleneck dove. Excuse me, sniffing like that. <coughs> um, what else do we have over here for you today? Shy Pan, you'd like to know, would lions take advantage of mist and be hunting on a morning like this? Absolutely. Um, the mist dampens sound a little bit. Um, and although not locally, you can still hear what's going on in the bush here next to you. It's very quiet and also the moisture content in the air wets everything and so footfalls are much quieter. Wind doesn't carry their scent quite as far. Oh, look there. I'll carry on with that explanation now. Let's just enjoy that sunrise. So that is a yellow sunrise up through the mist. It harbors the beginning of the end of the mist, unfortunately. But isn't that lovely? It's just nice to enjoy mornings like this, to be honest. Very thick cloud band, actually. If that sun has been completely obscured until now. That is awesome. <clears throat> Here we have a bull giraffe. Let's come over the road. <clears throat> so here we have the giraffe track from there to there, kicking up the sand into this very distinctive mound that looks like a buffalo track but without the split down the middle until you start to get to the back of the track where you can see the cloven hoof there. And it just tests me to how heavy the this uh, this animal is that it kicks up the sand like this. More doves, and we've got a rodent. Jared's buddy, you say you've never seen a giraffe track before. Well then let me allow me to put my hand next to it. Please take a screenshot. Jared's buddy, you can get yourself a screenshot of a giraffe track in C2. And then we've got a mouse track of some sort bushfield gerbil or a mouse track so there are the two back feet and they come past the two front feet so the, the, the mouse places the two front feet like this and then brings both back feet past the two front feet and places them on the outside and then jumps off the back feet so you've got the two back feet and the two front feet with the toes on the inside and not a squirrel because you can't see the back of the foot there <clears throat> let's see what else we've got going down here all right so talking more about the um, talking more about will lions hunt during this time um, <clears throat> so uh, the dampening effect of the moisture is probably the biggest benefit for, for these animals, uh, for lions hunting in the misty mornings. And quite often you'll see them hunting quite late because it also stays a bit darker um, and it doesn't get as hot. Now, Michael, you wanted to know what the best aspect of tracking is. I think it's the puzzling out of, of animals that are, that are, you know, so specialized in what they do. So, like trailing, which is what Herbie is an absolute master at. 
is being able to think like the animal you're following. Not following track for track, that's impossible. But to think this animal is going there because of these reasons and this condition. And to go there and have it confirmed by finding a track and of course in the terminal point finding the animal itself. It's, it's, I've been doing this for almost 20 years now and it still remains a mystery to me that is almost magical. Um, is the way that that the local guys here, Herbie and, and other trackers in this area, and, and this, this portion of the world harbors some of the greatest and most skilled trackers in the world. And um, just to work with these people is just really phenomenal. Really, really, it's, it's, a, it's a lost art um, that, that was saved in this area. And is well, one, there's lots of areas in the globe where trackers exist, but this is one of those nodes where trackers were... The, the art of tracking was kept alive and is now expanding exponentially underneath uh, organizations like Cyber Tracker and uh, the Field Guides Association of South Africa really pushing for qualifications and for recognition of this type of tracking. But to spend time with all these people is phenomenal. And um, so th there's spending time with this magic. If, if I could put it to you that way, Michael. The second thing is to put yourself against the analytical, um, the analytical uh, uh, method of interpreting what animal walked here. So track and sign interpretation, basically. How do I know that that's a squirrel? How did I know that that's an impala or a kudu or a giraffe for that matter of fact? That's an analytical process that, that you know, you just need to learn that. It just comes with attention and care to detail. And we'll tell you a lot about what animals exist on any one particular place as well. Come here, let's carry on walking. He's uh, going deeper into the mist cloud. Uh, the sun has disappeared. <coughs> Lucy, can I please find a pangolin track this morning? Um, okay, Lucy. <laughs> If we find one, I'll show it to you because I'm going to be just as excited as you, don't worry. But if there was a place to look for a pangolin track, the area that we're going into would be it. There's um, a gentleman, a scientist called Jonathan Swart, a couple of years back, spent a long time collaring various pangolins or putting tra trackers on them, various pangolins. And um, one of those pangolins that he collared was a male that lives in this area that we're walking to. The, 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 the collar has since fallen off. The, the study has reached its end, its terminal point. And, uh, and so <coughs> uh, we don't know where this pangolin is. But for quite a few years, Jonathan studied this particular pangolin's movements. And it moves from just other side, the view of the, the dam camera, on the other side of the dam down that area, through here, up and over quarantine, and then back around the camp and comes out in that area there. So if there was a place for it, this would be it. Ah, it's a nice morning this morning. Have a look at the sun there again, if you don't mind, please, Vim you can see that the upper layer of air is moving far faster than this is. Look at the clouds scudding across the sun. <coughs> Alan Pye, you want to know how much territory we typically cover in a three-hour bushwalk? Uh, it all depends on what we're looking for. Um, look at those clouds going across that sky. I wonder what the wind speed is up there, I mean, how far that is. Um, LM Sky, we do typically about anywhere between 5 and 10 miles a, a, a bushwalk. Um, we hardly ever do anything less than that. Today, we'll, today might be a little bit less than that, uh, simply because between segments, between me speaking to you, quite often we are moving at speed, at pace through the bush to get from one place to another, one environment to another. Today, while we wait for our Mara colleagues to come along, and with only myself here at Juma, um, it's taking Viam and I some time to, to make any, di any distance. And we're trying to stick to the road, as you can see, which is unusual for me. Um, but it's because Viam can't walk backwards and film uh, through the bush. He would fall over and spike himself on something nasty. So we'll just stick to the roads for now and, um, and have a chat. So today will be slightly lower than that. 
But um, to be honest with you, it's, it's lovely to walk out here. I would choose walking over drive any day of the week. And it's because there's just so many different things to see. Sorry, Vim. I'm going to ask you to come back up the road. This is giving us a beautiful view. The mist has, has coalesced onto a spider's web here, a tiny spider's web, which would be unnoticeable without the, uh, the mist droplets having caught on the web itself, or having condensed on the web. I draw your attention to how elegant and sophisticated that web is for a pinprick of an organism. <coughs> Can you imagine if that was the same size as a lion? And a lion using secretions that come out of the, the tip of its tail, basically, can weave a web to catch an elephant. Or well, maybe not an elephant. Probably a buffalo-sized animal. Imagine a lion could do that between two trees. And then subdue it using poisoned saliva in... <coughs> hollow needle-like canines and then wrap it up in a different kind of secretion from the end of its tail. I love these small things. Now this spider would have probably built this web and fixed it last night and as you can see it's billowing in the slight breeze, the upslope downslope breeze and it's no it's not by chance that the spider has built its web facing in this direction between these two branches. It knows that the best place for it is perpendicular to the upslope and downslope breeze that is prevalent in almost every slope. This spider has evolved to understand that before it builds its web in the day or at night time. And what it will probably do is eat up most of its web now and then rest up in a cavity or two that it creates either with its own silk or just underneath the bark for the rest of the day. Coming out to spin its web again tonight. Very cool. <coughs> Eduardo, you'd like to know what kind of spiders will be out this time of the day or year? That's a good question, Eduardo. Um, so pr most spiders only live for about a year. Um, some slightly more than that. You do get the odd spider that lives for longer. Baboon spiders, for instance, will live and can live up to 35 years. So your bigger spiders, your old world or more primitive spiders can live for longer than your more sophisticated spiders and some of your free roaming spiders. Winter generally kills off a lot of spiders here. It's too cold and the insect load is too little to support vast numbers of, of spiders. And so <clears throat> many spiders will now be born and will grow big by the time the end of summer comes along. So our spider populations right now are limited to a few of the larger old world spiders. Um, a few jumping spiders would be around, not very many. A few of these little web dwelling spiders will be around, not very many and not very diverse. Um, and then of course big, big spiders like baboon spiders will be around as well. Um, but by far and wide, by the time December, January, February comes about, there will be loads of spiders. Um, I can't remember what the actual figures are, but I want to say around about a thousand spiders per square, whatever, but every 10 meters or whatever. I can't remember what exactly the, uh, the, the fact is about how many spiders are actually per square meter, per hectare that we have out here. But it, it numbers in the thousands, it's crazy. And on a misty morning in December, <coughs> the ground is literally littered with, uh, with, uh, with uh, spider webs. It's a Bushman's grape. I wonder if one is ripe. They don't look too ripe at the moment. Now, I didn't do it. Do you want to know if spiders like that will build webs every day? Um, yes, they will. They'll build webs every day. I suppose unless the conditions are completely alien to it. 
This is a Bushman's grape. The flowers smell, as James quite rightly puts it, uh, smells like horse urine. So they, it's a bush that wafts this pungent stink around. But they produce a fruit called a Bushman's grape. That's what I'm, what you're looking at right there, and what I'm holding in my hand, and has a very grape-like taste. These ones are not ripe. <laughs> It tastes very similar to how the flowers smell. Um, right now, I'm not going to finish that one. Now, the aftertaste is quite grapey, but because it's not completely ripe yet, they don't taste that fantastic. <laughs> and VM says it tastes like urine because the leopards just sprayed it. So, too far from the rounds of truth. Sorry, Lou, won't you go with the, our, our viewer's name again? I missed that. Uh, D-Chef, you've asked what, what plant I tell will make for a good uh, tissue for my nose. Um, velvet bush willow, probably. So, Combrita mole uh, has a very large, very densely furry leaf. Which, uh, which will be very nice for, it's like a leathery leaf as well, so it'll be very nice and soft on my nose. I suppose I could use Peltiforum, the African wattle, although you run the risk of covering your hands in enough mucus to uh, <coughs> do a jellyfish proud. Um, so those two would probably be the ones that I'd use, although, you know, I suppose anything that works at the time will work. Right now I'm lucky enough to have uh, some tissue paper in my pocket so for the white flash the excuse for the white flash every now and again I think I'll have any shining top lips under control mostly for the rest of the walk all right we are coming now to a Wahlberg's Eagle's nest at the top of this tree now Wahlberg's Eagles migrate to North Africa and we've got a grey-headed bushrock calling here as well. That is that, that haunting whoop call. He is at the top of the tree there, Vim. The green. Oh, so mi middle, of, middle of the tree. On the right hand side. Ah, here he comes. Don't worry. So that was a very quick and very difficult thing to film, the grey-headed bushrack. But to draw your attention back to the Wahlberg's Eagle's Nest that we have here, the, um, they migrate to North Africa uh, every year. They come back down to South Africa to nest. They're breeding here. They come in, and one of the first eagles to arrive. I don't know if this nest has a pair of eagles in it at the moment. But it is the lower of the three large clumps. So the lowest one of the three large clumps of grass is the nest. The two larger clumps above it are the collections and untidy messes of social birds called the buffalo weavers who collect thorny sticks uh, and produce um, a multi-chambered nest. Um, and produce a... What do you, oh, there we go. There's the Wahlberg Eagles. Sorry, VM has him. I don't know how he managed to do that, looking at me, looking at the camera, and then still looking around and finding the Wahlberg's Eagle. There is the Wahlberg's Eagle. And you can see that tiny little crest on the head. It's quite a small eagle, one of the smallest ones that we have out here. It is a true eagle in that it has feathered legs. And they're looking at us. With a tiny little one feathered crest or two feathered crest on its head. And they come back to the same nest year after year after year, adding to it over the years, fixing it, repairing it. <coughs> Very nice. Oh, lovely morning. I haven't heard that lion calling again at all. Stefano, you'd like to know if I've heard or seen any of the migratory cuckoos yet. Um, I saw a cuckoo yesterday. 
<clears throat> it was difficult to say whether it was a red-chested cuckoo or an African cuckoo because it flew past the car while we were driving and I just caught a glimpse of a cuckoo shape and a grey back. Um, so th definitely the red-chested cuckoo is back because Tristan heard it a couple of days ago and confirmed that. Um, uh, but I, haven't, I myself haven't heard any of the cuckoos just yet. Um, so... Louise just said to me that we've also heard a classes cuckoo as well. So classes cuckoo are back, which is expected they'd be back with the Wahlbergs, Eagles and with the red-chested cuckoo. And we're only going to increase the tempo of the cuckoos coming back now. So <clears throat> basically from when Tristan heard that, all the way forward now for us, you know, until the end of summer, we're going to be hearing cuckoos on a, on a more pronounced basis. Right now, I heard the Birch, Birchall's cuckoo call, and then we've got that gray-headed bushrock still busy charming away in the bush and a very active rhino midden this is nice to see so both black and white rhino have both black and white rhino use middens and the reason why I want to show you this today is because it's World Animal Day I think today and um, We've chosen to do a bit of a, a, a spectacle of animals. We started off with leopard. We then went on to, on to lion yesterday. And today's animal for World Animal Day from Wild Earth is a rhino. Um, <clears throat> this is the midden of a white rhinoceros. And I know that because there's no presence of any sticks in this dung. If a black rhino had been around, and there has been a black rhino here in the last couple of months, there'd be sticks present in the dung. This is all just very fibrousy grass that the rhino has deposited and it's a male rhino that has deposited this dung predominantly and I'll show you why I think that is. Male rhino have um, used these middens as a not only as a latrine uh, which both sexes do but as a marking post. So male rhino will walk along he'll reverse into this particular spot defecate and then kick his back legs into the dung. As you can see it's created this hollow here he's done it so much. So kick the dung which gets the smell all over his feet and when he walks around through his territory he covers his territory in patchy footprint smells um, with his particular scent on it. Another rhino will know that this is his place. <coughs> Female rhino will also use this latrine. They tend to use the periphery of the latrine and their dung is entire. They do not kick it. So this is all female rhinoceros dung. So all the dung on the periphery would be female rhino. Um, they'll sometimes use the middle of the midden but generally that is restricted to the male rhino only. And this is just an active one. This is just a mountain of poo. Eh? I'm standing on it. Isn't that incredible? Lovely, eh? <coughs> Let's carry on down the road. The sun is now a bright orb. And it feels like the mist is lifting. What do you think, Vim? I think it's about the same, maybe. It feels like it's lifting. I don't think it is. Now we are walking through some thickets. Been a nice quiet start to the morning with the exception of that of that uh, of that lion that made that contact call just north of our boundary. It's been quiet since then. Let's go and have a look at these bones. The Nkuhuma lions when when they were <coughs> When they were um, when they were having their 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 feast years, which happened during the big drought, they were feeding on a buffalo a day at a stage. Sometimes more than one buffalo. One of the buffaloes they killed is this one here, and we're going to go and have a look at it. And while we get there, I just want to take this opportunity to uh, to apologise for the single feed from me today. We've got a few tech issues that are stopping the Mara from joining us just yet. Know though that the genius that is Alex Voz is on it and he will very soon, if he can at least, restore that connection and uh, we'll be able to see what my colleagues in the Mara are doing. So right now this is what is left of a buffalo that in a state of, uh, of malnutrition basically was caught by the Inkahumas 
and they then fed on this buffalo, leaving this scattering of bones, which is almost clear of meat and sinew. You can see the you can see the little bit of sinew left on this shoulder blade, and there's a hoof or two. Here we have a, a hoof. This is a hoof covering of this particular buffalo. Now this thing was stinking like you don't even understand at a point. Right now, it doesn't smell like much. Now these bones are starting to scatter throughout the bush. And lion cubs will pick them up and play with them. Elephant will pick them up and walk with them a distance. Also, they like to play with them. Hyena will pick these up and, for whatever reason, take it back to the cubs so that the cubs can develop those massively strong jaw muscles of theirs by chewing on them. <coughs> um, you'll find a, a host of smaller animals, jackal, uh, giraffe, kudu, uh, even other buffalo will come and pick up these bones over time, pick them up, chew them, carry them around, um, and they do that to boost their systems with some trace minerals that are only found in these bones and so the carcass will spread out over time and in a couple of years time you'll find the odd remnant of of this buffalo here but the bones will be spread out all over the place and just looking for the skull the skull is there on that side of the road so something has picked up the skull and has already transported it to that side of the road <coughs> And it's already got its covering of horn moth, caterpillar, uh, cocoons. Interesting. Now, John, you wanting to know while we're looking at these horn moths, uh, the casings of the horn moths which are there, um, how do these animals regenerate after the winter? Um, they do that through eggs. So the eggs would have been laid at the end of last season and basically I've spent the winter growing and then they'll emerge uh, now this time of the year. So animals will 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 emerge now, or the, 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 the insects will start to emerge now after being dormant and in eggs for a while. Let me try and turn this around without disturbing it too much. But these are all cocoons from a moth that, or it's actually a cocoon from a caterpillar and a moth will emerge from this that eats the horns uh, and specifically the keratin, this of the buffalo, the horn moth caterpillar, which then spins a silken cocoon with a little bit of exuvate from the from its body, um, and then emerges from a hole like that as a new horn moth to go and fly around and find other carcasses to go and lay itself on. This is the boss of the buffalo. When we when we're talking about the boss of the buffalo's horns, this is it. In a full-grown male, this is very calcified and closer together, this gap gets smaller. And then the curl of the horn and the sweep of the horn out to those, which is not too sharp. I mean, it's about as thick as my finger. But that coupled with the massively developed neck of these buffalo and the strength of these animals make that a formidable weapon. There is the join. This is where the muscles attach that holds the neck on and of course the swivel of the head which allows the buffalo to move itself around. Very nice, eh? Hey? That then will slowly decay and will fall away over the rest of the Now John, you want to know, well you said thank you for the answer on how do insects uh, emerge, but you also wanted to know how they stay so strong. Um, <clears throat> that's a good question. I suppose just the evolution of insects has led to the fact that they will lay many, many thousands of eggs over the course of the summer. Um, and not all of them will survive. A great many of them will not, in fact. But those that are that are 
laid in the best places possible have a whole host of uh, conditions that will contribute to how these eggs uh, make it through quite a harsh environment. Um, so I think it's 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 not quite hit and miss. It's not like coral, for instance, uh, which just saturates an area. There is some planning uh, to it. Um, and the, bless you. And the more sophisticated the the insect, the more the less eggs it will produce, and the more um, elegant and and uh, sp specific bless you. And the more specific it'll it'll get to choosing the right place, the the, the place with the chance of the highest success for these for the eggs to hatch. Um, but I, I definitely think in terms of insects, it comes down to the just the fact that they just lay so many. Uh, for the most part. That's in the evolution of the insect itself and its egg casing. Um, yeah. I mean, they're one of the most successful groups of animals on the planet. <coughs> I think they've gone through things that humankind hasn't even dreamed possible and have survived fine up until this point. You know, suffice it to say, I think that they know things about how to survive on this planet that we could absolutely take some uh, some lessons from. Let's find something interesting to show you. These fallen down areas here of deadfall are quite interesting. Sometimes you find some cool things hiding underneath the bark. Let's have a look here. Here we have a fungus of some sort. Now fungus, fungus kills trees far in far greater numbers and in far greater volume than what uh, what elephants do. In, ex in in fact, this is a fungus that has grown. It's a bracket fungus that has now grown on this on this uh, tree trunk. And talking about absolutely saturating an area with pores, uh, with spores, or with with eggs. Every one of those pores there would have harbored millions of tiny mushroom spores and that would have wafted away on the breeze to go and land and settle in other areas and we're talking about millions of babies per mushroom that basically will use that and they break down woody plant material and eventually help to contribute to enriching the soil and to to, to making sand basically or making the humus at least on the sand. This is a dying or dead knob thorn. It looks dead and it looks like it was ring barked by elephant which killed it. Elephants in the drier parts of, of uh, in the drier times of the year will ring bark these, these trees <coughs> and eat the inside bark quite often right down to the woody cambium well, they eat the entire cambium basically right down to the woody hardwood. Sometimes the tree as you can see here We'll, we'll be able to thicken an injury and it will be able to, to still feed itself from its roots up to the top and then elephants just come back the next year and take off the bark again and eventually this will kill the tree. But it also opens up these woody parts to termites and to fungus. And you can see that these termites have just absolutely infested this. Look how soft that's getting. Look how soft that is. That's just fungus and termites breaking down this. Amazing. Eh? Alright, what we're going to quickly do is we are going to be going to a tech loop soon. And the reason for that is Alex is working his magic out in the Mara. We're going to be switching to some other system, I suppose. Um, so don't go anywhere. We're quickly going to go down for a little bit. Uh, but when we come back, hopefully you'll have us in South Africa on the bushwalk, but you'll also have the rest of my teammates up in the Mara. So see you in a little bit.
of the uh, Sunrise Safari, this particular part of it brought to you from the Maasai Mara in Kenya. And uh, my name is James Henry, but that is not important. What is important is that Fergus is on camera leading the strategy this morning, and he has managed to get us into a position where we have got nine lion cubs and two mothers. Isn't that wonderful? Now, for those of you who have been watching and following the story of the Black Rock Pride, which we've been watching and enjoying over the last little while, it is incumbent on me to tell you that this morning we had an interesting interaction where the lioness who was eating the zebra last night seemed to have remained there for the whole evening. And then she joined the others very recently. But sort, of a, sort of Simba Lion King moment there on the on the rock. I only noticed it because I had the bad file that there was some going a wonderful sighting here of all these cats. And things are getting quite calm now. The real question to me is where on earth Technical difficulties we are experiencing this morning, but luck is on our side now because we've got an awesome, awesome view of this black rhino. And the rhino is our animal for the day for, let me get this right, it's World Animal Day, but we at Safari Live are making a week worth of World Animal Day, and the rhino is our animal of the day. So I hope you understand that all. I'm not sure which day World Animal Day is, it might be coming up, I guess it is, <coughs> but we are taking it to the next level by picking an animal every day for the week. And how awesome is this? He's lifting up his tail because he's a little bit distressed by the fact that there's vehicles around. So let's just watch her. You may charge into them. My name's Scott. It's great to have you on board. I'm teamed up with Craig on camera. Black Rhino are a lot more short-tempered than the white rhino that you see down south in Juma. And that is why he's curling his tail up like that. He's just not entirely sure about our presence and they can often actually come running up to the vehicles and turn at the last moment just to intimidate us hello to fan you'd like to know if rhinos are group animals like wildebeest and black rhinos are ordinarily solitary but occasionally you will get a few females together when they're raising their young and the white rhino the females can hang out in small herds and I guess even young males sometimes hang out together so there's a few differences between the black and the white rhino this is the black, it's smaller than the white rhino, it's got a hooked lip, it feeds on leaves as opposed to the white rhino which feeds on grass there you can see some zebra and wildebeest in the background and it may actually even chase them. I've seen black rhino, I've seen black rhino quite often chase other antelope around. Their eyesight is terrible, so they get a little bit nervous, even though they are huge and not much can mess with them. The fact that they cannot see very well 
makes them a little bit cautious and that's why they swivel their ears around from side to side their hearing is very good wonderful stuff well Hello again. I'm told I was sounding a little bit like a chipmunk squeaking at you. So it should be back in order now. Oh, there's a hyena in the background. Some zebra. And just more magical scenes from the Masai Mara. It's a beautiful, beautiful morning. It's warming up. I've just taken two layers of jackets off. We came out early in the hope of finding a female cheetah called Malaika. She was nowhere to be seen, <clears throat> excuse me, in the area where we left her yesterday evening. So we've just been kind of cruising about. We actually, to be honest, saw another film vehicle racing at high speed across the plains. So we decided to follow them for a while because we figured they may have some useful information. But the speed that they were driving at and the distance that we followed them for started becoming a little bit too much. So we ditched them, but I mean, by following them, we got into this general area. And this is only the second black rhino that I've been able to show you since I've arrived in the Mara. The first one was actually on my first drive within the first 15 minutes. And since then, I haven't had many sightings and certainly not sightings nearly as good as this one. Now, I'm not sure if you got the little bits about the fact that it's World Animal Day at some point during the week. Us at Safari Live have turned it into World Animal Day. <laughs> and we are picking an animal every day. day. We've done leopard, lion, leopard, lion yesterday, and I think yesterday and I think rhino today. So what a great start to have a black rhino. One of the rhinos you certainly wouldn't have seen nearly as often as the whites. Although, having said that, I'm talking rubbish because we can't show you the white rhino that exists in the Sabi Sands. So, you probably wouldn't have seen many at all. There's a few more hyena in this valley. And it would be awesome to see this black rhino chase one. So, be ready for that. Beautiful. Now, I don't want to get too close to it. They're not as relaxed in general as white rhino and I can be a little bit short tempered so I'm keeping my distance so that this boy can have a peaceful morning and so that we don't get a rhino horn through our door hi Dory you'd like to know how to age a black rhino Whew. with difficulty for me I haven't worked with black rhino very much in my career sadly um, but I guess, you know, like most animals, si general size. Oh, here we go. Come on, please, can you chase that hyena? If you just zoom to the pan to the left a little bit, you'll see there's a hyena that's kind of approaching this rhino. And this is going to be, yes, chase it. <laughs> awesome. That's what I was hoping for. What a bonus. And I think this hyena is just being a little bit curious. And the rhino is not having any of it.
there is also a hyena on the other side of the rhino so maybe that's what the this hyena that we're looking at now is trying to get to maybe it's got nothing to do with the fact that there's a rhino there it's just merely through default that the rhino is in the hyena's way hello to Barbara you'd like to know if rhino will react the same way to lion as it would this hyena and yes as a general rule rhino will not be happy with the presence of lions and will chase them off I had a sighting once where I was following two young male white rhinos and they literally for about an hour and a half were just pestering this male and female lion who were trying to get some romancing in but these rhinos would just chase them the lions would lie down chase them again it wasn't a high-speed chase they're kind of more like walking after the lions and they'd get close to them chase them a little bit further catch up again so I think yes the the fact is that rhinos do not really tolerate or like predators and like I said earlier they also will chase antelope from time to time just because they can what an awesome scene let's just give it one more second see if he doesn't decide to chase it one more time no so it seems oh hold on there's another hyena that it's heading straight towards so let's see what happens here uh, that hyena that it was heading towards just ran off so I think everything is going to be fairly calm and peaceful now there's quite a few migrating herds still in this part of the Mara. We are kind of midway down the reserve side. Actually, this is going to be far from ideal, but let me try and show you on a map on my phone where we are. Oh no, this is a bad idea. Cancel that. I just had a look at the map on my phone and it's not going to be very easy to be able to tell you where we are and what's what, but still some herds here which is good prospects maybe we'll be able to find the musketeer coalition of five male cheetah today they've been dodging us for a while now and it'd be wonderful to see them again good we're gonna leave this rhino to find a spot to snooze leave him in peace and send you across to james with some little cubs Rhinos have now split up. One of them has headed off down towards that little drainage section. They've come away from the den. They did go to the den site and now they've moved away from it. And I just want to give them a little bit of space. There's been a, there's been a lot of activity around here this morning. And so we're just going to give them a bit of space. And we'll just watch them disappear over the hill there. We will stay with them. I just want to give them some space, like I say. Uh, the other lioness is moving down towards with with them and with another. Do it just two cubs? Or just the one? So I'm not sure why they've forsaken their little den site. But there they go. And maybe there will be a reveal of the third lioness. It's a wonderful little picture. I always love how determined their faces are when they have to move for any distance. They put their fat little ears flat back on their backs of their heads. Determined face and off they go with their mums showing how strong they are. There's another section of rocks there that perhaps they're heading towards. And also, of course, there was the male around here somewhere, and I think he's gone into these guari bushes. She's just marking her territory a little bit there. So we'll keep with them. I'm not sure what they're going to do. While we do that, I believe that uh, ready now to say good morning to you is Brent Lionsmith. 
Very funny, Mr. Henry. You're just jealous of my large mane. Good morning, good morning. My name is Brent Leo Smith, hence the Lion Smith. And I have Manu on camera. And isn't it an absolutely gorgeous morning here in the Mara? Uh, unfortunately, we're not having quite the same luck as James and Scott on the other side. Uh, we went in search of that female cheetah who's got the four cubs, we can now confirm. And uh, unfortunately, she wasn't around the den, so we didn't hang about. We carried on. Now, off to the right of us, we have the largest antelope in the Mara. Uh, with some striped donkeys. But there we go. Uh, some eland. Isn't that gorgeous? Oh, and some Ellie's in the background. So one of the permanent residents of the Mara, the eland. There are some that will migrate, local migrations, but generally we will have eland in the Mara for a whole year, which is fantastic. And at the moment, they're down along and on the, in the basins. And as it gets drier or wetter, sorry, as it gets wetter, they're going to move up towards the escarpment. Now, a big eland bull is bigger than a buffalo, can you believe? Can weigh just under a thousand kilograms. Trimming the tops of the Thamida grass or the red oats grass. Now, we're going to keep on our search. We're hopefully going to find some lions or whatever fantastic creatures might be out there. But while we meander, please feel free to ask us questions. And you can do that by using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. I would love to hear from you. And actually, thinking about that, who can tell me what other spiral horned antelope apart from the eland occurs in the Mara use the hashtag Safari Live but very exciting one of the hardest animals to find on foot Steph has it you can just stop right there all right, we've just come walking down the road and as you can see, I'm not trying to make contact. We've got a leopard right next to us here. Have a look behind my shoulder there. That is very, very close for a leopard. We're actually just looking at his track. Squirrel started to make a noise. We looked up and 10 meters away is this leopard. Now, with us creating space and not facing him, it's giving him the impression that we haven't seen him, which is a good thing. So what we're trying to do is not not show our faces to him. He's hidden behind a bush. I've got a feeling that this is either <coughs> Hosanna or Tamba. Difficult for me to say because I don't want to pick up my binoculars and scare it. Leopard, unlike lion, you do not want to... You don't want to uh, you don't want to make eye contact. Luis just confirmed that that's Hosanna. And just how relaxed is that? I mean, leopard on foot at 20 meters is incredible. And you can see he's now lifted up his head. He's a little bit more relaxed. Not much, but a little bit more. I'm looking at his tail just to make sure that that doesn't start to flick up and down. He can still see us looking at him, but we still got our backs towards him. <coughs> this is amazing. It's incredible. We're actually just looking at his tracks going, wow, these leopard tracks are fresh. <laughs> Meanwhile, he was watching us the whole time. Amazing. Now, he's lying in the open there. And to be honest, you can hardly even see him. I see a few of you are posting the fact that you're amazed. And to be honest with you, this is the second time I've been this close to a, a leopard on, on foot here, one of these cubs. I've obviously been closer to other leopard um, on foot, but they hardly ever have this reaction. 
all the tricks that we've learned over the years of keeping leopard in sight while you uh, while you call in your comrades are being put into play here with uh, with this particular sighting and they work which is amazing which is don't make eye contact create a bit of distance stay in the open put you if you can without exposing yourself put your back to them and that's what we've done here and he hasn't even moved Normally, as soon as they see you making distance, they, they move off. <coughs> now, Luis says a few of you are saying that, that, that Hosanna likes to follow people on foot. Um, there's a possibility of that. It's not uncommon for, for leopard to do that. Uh, I've heard of female leopard which are born in lodges uh, do the same thing, follow housekeepers around, become, become mischievous. And in this particular case, I think that there's a good chance of that. It obviously becomes a danger if they start to think of humans as a game. But can you imagine how scary it would be if Leopard had to hunt us all of a sudden? And he's lifted up his head again. I don't want to go off to the side anymore and expose him completely to us. At the moment he thinks that he's hidden behind that bush, which is exactly what we want to keep. Uh, we want to keep that sort of status quo prevailing. That is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly everybody, it's, it's, it is uncommon to find leopard this relaxed on foot. Now, in, in actual fact, it's unheard of. Um, I'm gauging how long we stay here and what we do. And, you know, at the moment he is not giving any indication that he's worried about us at all. It's completely safe for us. He's not growling. That slight tail flick is because of the squirrel and the Franklin next to him, just increasing the anxiety a little bit. But at the moment, no danger whatsoever. Now, James Richards, you were wondering if Osana would still be as relaxed on foot as he was a couple of months ago when we were doing a lot of bushwalks. And this obviously answers your question. Uh, he hasn't lost that that lack of fear uh, that is associated to most leopard on foot. This is honestly just amazing. Now, Ages, you want to know what will happen if I square up and make eye contact with him? He'll probably, it'll increase his, his anxiety to a point where he'll turn around and he'll slink off into the drainage line behind him. <coughs> so, what you don't want to do is leopard like to know that they're hidden, even if it's just a false belief. So right now we're just standing here. I'm not even facing him. My back is faced away from him. Uh, Viam is slightly turned to the side rather than square up. Um, Herbie, who's standing behind us, is staring balefully at him. But uh, but you know the the, the, the key is is that we've kept the, that little bush that he's got between him and us, and. I'm closest to him and I've got my back towards him, which is making him feel a little bit more secure. I'm also covering Viam with the majority of my body, so <clears throat> for those hearing us and our voices, which would not be uncommon, he's heard voices since he was a little cub, uh, human voices, um, we've, got, uh, we've got our back to him and in my opinion, that's what is counting here. At some point, he will probably stand up. But for those of you who were watching yesterday, you saw what happens when a leopard gets alarmed. Yesterday, we arrived at some lions around Twin Dams, and Tamba came down to drink, and he got a smell of those lions. And even at 50 or 60 yards, it was enough to send him sprinting away to the top of a tree. That is the normal reaction of a, of a leopard. Amazing. What we're going to do is create a little bit more distance just to get his tail to stop moving again. We're going to try that. And while we do that, we're going to send you back up to the morrow with two James. He's got some lion to show you. They seem to have settled now 
underneath this little sort of shady bush and please excuse the shake of the camera it's not because Fergus has had too much caffeine this morning it's because the wind continues to blow here in a rather coastal fashion and it does make for very difficult film conditions um, wonderful that Horsana there is so relaxed around Steph on foot I was just trying to remember his age I've forgotten how old he is I seem to remember him being in, born in March is that correct so he's now 18 months old or so February they were born in February there we are Phew. I remembered just as Rebecca said it okay so he is now February March April May June July August September October so he's approaching 20 months old now male leopard at 20 months is great fun I must say he's just coming into the time before he hits puberty where he'll be very confiding with people on foot and that's great I know I'm talking about a leopard and we're looking at some wonderful lions here but I am wondering what has happened to my favorite which of course is his sister and I believe she hasn't been seen for some time which is a little worrying Anyway, these lions do not seem to want to settle, and it's because they're being harassed by nine cubs, and where the third lioness is, I have no idea. So there's still an unsolved mystery with this group of lions at the moment, and we need to try and figure out what's happening there. I'm not sure we'll spend the whole morning with them. I think we may move on in a little while and see what else we can find. There was talk of a leopardess with a kill not too far from here, which would be quite fun, and apparently her, she does have a cub, so we may go and spend some time around there. Nancy, you say, is the lion the only big cat that only has two teats? They don't have two teats, they've got four teats. Um, so, uh, and I think as far as I'm aware, all cats have got four teats, unless I'm very much mistaken. So I think it's a pretty standard number of, of teats. Shall I just roll slightly forward, Ferg? I'm just going to roll very slightly forward. Just give us a slightly better view of what's going on in there. There we go. Yeah, and they are doing their best. One one mother, of course, or one lioness refusing to do any feeding whatsoever, is she? No, she's doing a little bit. And this is where they learn to fight over food, of course. Lions are not the most egalitarian when they feed. And what she's doing here, or what those cubs are doing here, are going to stand them in good stead for when they have to fight over a carcass. No one is going to feed them when it comes to the point of eating meat. Maybe you're wondering if there are feeding times in the day. Yes, there are. The feeding time is at uh, quarter past five in the morning, then again now at eight o'clock in the morning, and then they have a long break till about 11.20 or so. I'm obviously talking rubbish, Maver. No, there are no specific feeding times at all. And the random nature of the feeding, I think, prepares them for uh, sort of real life, if you like because when they're adults they don't have three squares a day like us what they do is they eat when they can sometimes it's a uh, uh, you know they'll eat a huge amount for a week they'll sit on a buffalo sometimes they'll eat two small things and then go with nothing for uh, say a week or 14 days even and so it's much the same with the suckling there's no set feeding time and we've certainly seen them feeding now we've seen them feeding in the evening we've seen them not feeding in the evening like yesterday for example they didn't feed at all and so no no set feeding times at all the lionesses just seem to come back randomly when they have, a, have the impression perhaps that uh, oh yes we've got something else to do Let's go back to the den site and see if the cubs want to eat something. And some of them are settling down and having a bit of a sleep, so maybe these chaps have produced a lot of good milk. Tell me, you say, do the long dark stripes on their backs mean anything? Um, 
I'm pretty sure they have to do with camouflage. It's the long black hairs there that make the little spots. And the people ask why on earth do lions have spots when they're cubs? It's because when they're hiding, they of course hide in dappled light. They ha hide in the shade. And so it makes sense for them to be spotty like a leopard or a cheetah, for example. Um, but when they're big, when they're adults, their size and their hunting strategy in the grasslands precludes the need for spots and it's much more effective for them to be that tawny color and so that's why they have the spots and the black hairs there are basically just how the spots are formed and they will eventually fall out and leave the tawny color that we're so used to. Does that make sense? So it's not a kind of black mantle like the white mantle on the cheetah You've got the claws, and look at the flattened ears, very irritated. Okay, we're going to go back across to South Africa, some 2,500 miles. I believe that Stefan has had to leave Husana, I'm not sure why, but I know that he is going to give you an excellent explanation. We are still with young Hosanna, can you believe it? We've now created a bit more distance, we're probably another 10 yards further away, so we're at about 30 yards from him now, and he was even lying down just now, can you believe it? Just the tail still displaying a slight agitation. Not enough to get him to face us, so the tail is, 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 is a fine mood tuner. If he was facing us, in other words, if he was on his haunches, ready to stand up and move, I would create even more distance. But right now, he's not even looking at us. He's got his back to us, all four feet facing the other direction. And he is looking at something further away to where we are. Lots of impala in this area, lots of grey daker, lots of bushbuck. It's a good place for him to lie, actually. Jody, you'd like to know what he'd do if I sat down. Um, Jody, there are three of us in this group. It's myself and VM, uh, who's holding the camera that you're looking through at the moment, and then Herbie. Um, if, I, if all three of us sat down, he'd probably relax even further. Um, but that would be dangerous for us, not from the leopard point of view, but it reduces mobility. And out here, with a leopard just where it is, drainage line where we are, I wouldn't sit down here. And even if I sat down, it would be slightly inauthentic, but VM would still be standing, as would Herbie. <coughs> but if all of us sat down with our backs towards him, uh, he'd probably take a little bit of notice. He might even feel bold enough to stand up. He won't approach us closer, I don't think. He may do, from an inquisitive point of view, but I don't think. And so I don't think it'll change much, to be quite honest with you. Right now, he's just lying down, looking at... I don't know what he's looking at. Now. Barbara, you've asked if he recognizes our voice or any of the guide's voices. Barbara, I actually think he, they do. Um, I haven't seen him often enough, I don't think, for him to recognize my voice, but he definitely will take some solace from the tone and the volume of my voice and my body language and my facial expressions. Um, so, while not me, he, over time he will recognize different voices, I think. Um, Leopard are a lot more intelligent than what we give them credit for. They've got a larger brain than a lion does in a body that's a quarter of the weight. And uh, I personally think that they are, they're so adaptive. They, 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 they evolved to adapt. And I think that just that simple fact means that they can learn. And, uh, and why not being able to learn voices? They might associate it with no problem, indifference, food, um, safety, uh, a threat. You know, there's a lot of different things that you could say that uh, that that associated to. I'm hoping that people on foot <coughs> are associated with a few voices that he finds calming, if not reassuring, at least with indifference, like he's doing now. 
And I think that's exactly what it is. He doesn't even care. To him, we're just another part of his environment. And ultimately, that is the goal of, of conservation, is a harmony, in my opinion, of people and animals. I, I suppose, maybe not the ultimate goal, but maybe one of their foundation pillars is harmony. And, I mean, as you can see right here, there's, he doesn't want to try and kill me, I don't want to try and kill him. We're not in competition for the same food resource. We just are co-inhabiting an area, his home, we visitors, and he's tolerating us. And the hope is that in more urban environments, that over time, lessons learned like we are proving here, that leopards will be tolerated in more urban environments and not seen as the threat to livestock and to people's lives that there are now and persecuted because of this prejudice. Lucian, you want to know if they really have larger brains than lions? Lucian, we've got a lion skull and a leopard skull in our museum collection. And James and I the other day compared the two. And without, without actually pouring water into the brain case itself and measuring how much volume they hold, they look the same. They look, they look, the leopard's one looks slightly bigger because its skull is smaller. But they've pretty much round about the same size, um, the phenomenon is that a leopard will weigh at most, you know, 60 to 90 kilograms. A lion goes up to 250 kilograms, almost four times as more for the same size brain. And if you have a look at what determines intelligence, the brain size to body weight ratio, um, that means that the leopard is a lot more intelligent than the lion. Another big yawn, not showing us his teeth, that was just a normal cat yawn. A snarl from a leopard is like a snarl from a house cat or from any of the cats. It's all anger, no mistaking a spit or a snarl from, uh, from these cats at all. He's grooming himself, another, complete indi another indication of complete sort of trust and he's going to lie down. Can you believe it? 40 yards from a male leopard and he's lying down cleaning his fur and by 40 yards I mean for those of you who are just joining us we're 40 yards away from this leopard on foot and have been here for the last 20 minutes or so it's mad it's crazy <laughs> 